The study of management can often tread a fine line between art and science, which, for the leaders of companies, can often paint a confusing picture. As such, today on Locad TV, we're delighted to be joined by Dennis Torish, who's going to discuss with us how much research into management can be trusted and what we can learn from his book entitled Management Studies in Crisis. Dennis, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, as always, we'd like to start off by learning a little bit about our guests. Um, so perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you, Kieran. Uh, I am currently a professor of leadership and organization studies at the University of Sussex Business School. I also edit an academic journal called Leadership. And as you say, I recently published a book which is actually called Management Studies in Crisis, Fraud, Deception and Meaningless Research reflecting the fact that I've grown increasingly concerned over the past few years about what I see as fundamental problems in the academic study of management and its irrelevance, not just for practicing managers, but for society at large. Okay, brilliant. And um, that's what we're kind of discussing today, our kind of topic, we've called it the triumph of nonsense in uh, management studies. Um, sounds fairly strong, Johannes. So um, what's the kind of idea from your perspective? So I would not claim any, you know, deep expertise in uh, in management studies. I just happen to be, you know, CEO of a company, fifty something employees. Uh, but my, I would say, very anecdotal and casual observation that most of the things that are pushed my way, uh, um, usually, I would say, if I were to take to the letter this sort of many of the ideas that are, you know, based on studies that are pushed my way, uh, I think would be. Um, downright harmful to most of my employees. You know, it's, it's, it, there are many of uh, practices, especially, I don't know, for example, during the latest uh, couple of years on the idea, for example, that uh, even small, relatively small companies should have like a chief happiness officer. I mean, I'm very deeply skeptical that if I start to micromanage the happiness of my own employees, they will be more happy. You know, again, I'm not saying that there might be science, but I'm, I'm very, very skeptical. And my instinct tells me that um, as an employer, that's really none of my business. And actually, I'm pretty sure that if I start to meddle with uh, the sort of happiness of my own employees, they will pretty much have the exact opposite effect. So again, I have no science, it's just gut feeling, but uh, when there are these sort of studies that are pushed my way, I'm just deeply skeptical, I would say. Okay, and Dennis, let's talk a little bit about the, the book then. Um, management Studies in Crisis, it sounds dramatic. I mean, you mentioned it was kind of, you, you noticed things that were happening in kind of industry that, that, that led you to be concerned. Um, so why is it that you decided to kind of write this book for this topic? Well, it reflects some of the concerns that Johannes has just mentioned uh, as well. Um, if you study some of the literature, it would appear that managers and leaders, and the further up the chain you are, the more this is the case, <clears throat> are encouraged to be responsible for absolutely everything in their employees' lives. We had a, a growth a few years ago of something called, for example, spirituality leadership, in which leaders were encouraged to actually try and present life lessons to their employees that would in some way change their views of spirituality. And uh, some organizations in the United States have taken this quite literally and organized things like prayer breakfasts with the CEO. But I think most people would find attempts to do that kind of thing as an interference in their private lives and feel that it's their responsibility to define their values for themselves to feel um, as spiritual about their work or as unspiritual about their work as they decide to be the case. And in terms of things like happiness at work, it's very, if you need to appoint a chief happiness officer, then that implies that work in itself is in some way alienating for people, that it's making them a very unhappy. And I think that rather than appoint a chief happiness officer, you should probably just stop doing some of the things that you're actually in the process of doing that is making people very unhappy. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point. Um, I'd like to be fairly positive and think that, that work is a place you spend sort of five days of the week there. So you need to be kind of happy in what you do. Um, in terms of this kind of research that goes on into kind of management studies, Janice, um, how much actual science is there behind it? Or like we said in the introduction, is it kind of more crossing towards a bit of a dark art? I mean, what I've casually observed is that there has been, you know, um, extensive, um, I would say, frauds in some areas of academia with p hacking, and uh, which has been rampant, especially on the, I would say, on soft sciences. Because for my C, again, I'm not 
I, I don't claim to be, you know, uh, an expert in the in some sort of fields like uh, sociology and these other things. Um, but what I have observed is that uh, p-hacking, my, my background is statistician, so p-hacking is fairly trivial to execute. So p-hacking is fundamentally that if you start making a lot of measurements uh, and, and then um, let's say you measure 10 variables, then you end up with pretty much the square of those numbers in terms of, uh, so basically time, t tens times times, you know, where to combine those variables, 10 times 9, but so you end up with basically uh, the square number of, of hypotheses that you can test if you take all those variables. So if you take 100 variables, you can easily test 10,000, you know, hypotheses. And out of that, if you, if you say to publish a result, I need to have like a, something where I, I'm confident that there is only, le let's say, less than 5% chance that this result is due to r pure randomness. Well, if you test thousands of hypotheses, you, uh, you, no matter which data set you get, you're going to find plenty of, of things to conclude. Uh, and that is going to be, I would say, completely accidental. And the idea of p-hacking is that if you format your studies by actually asking tons of questions, making tons of observations, then you will end up with tons of things that you can observe. And even worse, I believe, in the sort of soft science, is that fundamentally, you're going to end up with, I would say, results that are every single time completely novel, mostly because they're wrong. <laughs> so, 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 so you see, the, the thing is that when you practice p-hacking, and again, the idea is that you can ask people questions, you can make observations, you have many variables, and at the end of the day, you cherry pick you know, hypotheses that, would, that, you, that are just made up, and you can actually, t what, what you do not see behind the paper is that maybe thousands of such hypotheses have been you know, tested ahead of time. And so in the end, you end up with uh, a data set that is valid. You know, there was no question. The data set has been collected without bias, whatever. This is not where the bias lie. You, you have an hypothesis. The hypothesis is valid, no question. And when you check this hypothesis, which happened to be completely novel according to the standard of science against this data set, it match. Uh, but what you do not see, and that's this idea of p-hacking, is that maybe you've tested thousands of hypotheses, uh, and most of them were actually complete nonsense. And <laughs> so that's, that's again, um, that's something that I see uh, that has been kind of, uh, from my perspective, is that uh, statistics have been extensively, I would say, misused in, a, in, in, in great many, you know, fields of academic research. Okay, Dennis, it's a fairly kind of strong statement, that one. So would you agree? Would you say from what you've observed in the world of management studies, there is that scientific kind of grounding? I would agree very much with what Johannes has just said there. We have to remember that academics are not uh, rewarded and promoted for finding the truth. They are rewarded and promoted for publishing articles in so-called top management journals. And these journals favor findings that appear to be novel that have some kind of interesting story to tell and which can be defined as producing statistically significant results. That is, as Johannes has explained, statistical tests show that the findings haven't actually arisen by chance. But the problem in this period of big data is that you can find utterly spurious correlations between almost anything. Um, as an exercise in how this is done, an academic a number of years ago published a finding that showed for example, a statistically significant relationship between levels of rainfall and inflation in the economy. There is a very amusing website now available called Spurious Correlations, which shows, for example, a very significant relationship between consumption of margarine in the state of Maine and the levels of divorce within that state as well. So you can produce all kinds of findings that turn out not necessarily to be true. And... Uh, there is a bias, in my opinion, in management research now, not just to uh, produ produce work that produces these findings, but to conduct research which can only produce these findings. Otherwise, your results aren't um, uh, publishable and you have wasted your time. I'm thinking about, for example, the recent fad for what is called authentic leadership theory. And much of the empirical research in that, in my opinion, is absolutely flawed, consisting of giving out people survey questions to answer, and then they find a correlation between people, whether people are generally happy with their life in this organisation, and some measures of their satisfaction with the, the leader, and they assume quite erroneously that this shows there is such a thing as authentic leadership. In my opinion, the field is rife 
with these kinds of problems and not only with those kinds of problems. Yeah. And Johannes, you're kind of in touch with kind of supply chain directors, sort of management teams on a weekly basis. I mean, what do you see as kind of the, the impact of this kind of maybe meaningless research in some ways? What do you see as the impact on those kind of management teams? Um, I think, you see, my point is that it's, it's mostly negative, but in, in a way that is, that is very subtle. You know, I believe that, um, and that's a belief, you know, and a casual personal observation is that uh, one of the characteristics of, of science, of good science, is that it's profoundly counterintuitive. You know, it's that because you see, if it was intuitive, you would not need science. You know, it's it's in life most of the things that are just intuitive. You know, people have been just knowing that, and what we have called to call science, you know, in the modern way, are all these, all those areas where our just our intuition, our just senses are just deceptive, where it's just not sufficient, where we need to develop instrument. Because, well, if, if intuition and, and basically sentiment was enough, those things would have been known, you know, 5,000 years ago. Um, and for example, because I've, I've met, you know, many of, of the, um, I would say, brilliant, you know, supply chain director, brilliant, you know, uh, leaders. And the interesting thing, but brilliant in what sort of sense? In the sense that they get results. And for example, one of the very surprising, you know, aspect is that most of those people in terms of personality, would say are probably you know um, uh, relatively discreet. You know they don't. They are not necessarily. If you were to meet those people in a bar and have a discussion, you would be probably hardly pressed to think that this person is actually running a half a billion euro budget annually to run a supply chain. It looks like a very very regular person, uh, with um, fairly you know not m much more modest than usual, but very very average. And that's something that is interesting because you see. Uh, in the sort of media and the sort of press, when you say authentic leadership, you would think that you, you have some kind of flamboyant personality that are, uh, you know, um, that have a lot of charisma, etc. But my again casual observation would be would tend to point out pretty much to the opposite. And I can even you know propose an explanation for that, is that um, if if you are very as a manager, you know, you have a very strong personality, tons of charisma. It, it can have, you know, there is dark side to it. The dark side can be that, for example, um, you just prevent dissent. You know, that, that it's, it's very easy. You already have the upper hand just because you're, you're the boss, you know. So if on top of that, not only you have the upper hand just because, you know, in the hierarchy you're higher, if, if you, on top of that, uh, you yourself has a personality that is literally, you know, uh, imposing upon the entire hierarchy, then the question is, where is there any room for dissent? And again, you would think, why do you want dissent? Well, it turned out that usually, you see, that's another thing about technology and science. It's counterintuitive. So if you ask, you know, most retailers at the end of the 90s, what do you think about e-commerce? Most people would think, well, we don't care. And maybe those people have like young engineers that tell them it's the future. But if you don't tolerate dissent and people who disagree with you, how are you going to, you know, embrace the next thing? Okay. Um, Dennis, from, from your views then, what can be done? I mean, we sort of mentioned there's kind of gaps in management research, um, but what can actually be done to, to improve and to make things maybe a little bit more scientific? Well, I agree, first of all, very much with what Johannes has just said. And I was interested that you used the expression of dark side of charisma. And coincidentally, I published a book a few years ago called The Dark Side of <laughs> transformational leadership uh, which addresses this and I absolutely agree that we need to dissent within organizations or then we become totally dependent on the alleged wisdom of an infallible genius at the center and that creates what have been described as fragile organizations because the organization is only as good as the last decision of the so-called infallible leader. So what do we need to do about all this? Well I think there are a number of things that we need to do we need to change the practices within academic journals uh, so that they are more willing to publish what they regard as negative results. That is, publish findings that don't show statistical significance. I think our academic journals need to be open to more multiple modes of inquiry. I also think they actually need to um, put a little bit less emphasis on another thing that they stress too much, and that is the development of theory. I'm all in favour of theory. I think theory is a very good thing. The problem, however, with academic management research is that this becomes a condition of employment, of publication. So, for example, if you have a very interesting empirical observation 
uh, of a counterintuitive kind, and I agree that they are the most important kinds of observations we can encounter, but you don't yet have a fully developed theory to explain it, then it's very difficult to get published. And what this encourages people to do is to engage in absolutely tortured, unreadable uh, writing of the most pretentious kind, and which the tendency is to produce uh, all kinds of obscure French philosophers claim that their contribution to management studies has been, quotes, unjustly neglected, and then try and push some of their alleged insights as the basis for some new management practice. And in terms of these philosophers, the deader they are, the better, because then you can even more uh, go out of your way to claim some kind of unique contribution. So those things, I think, need to be changed. And I also think in terms of academic careers, and we're talking about management studies here, the actual academic study of management, it would be very good if people were promoted more often for the quality of their ideas rather than necessarily where they publish those ideas. I think it would encourage more open-ended modes of inquiry. And maybe we need to put less emphasis on how much people publish anyway, because one of the side effects of this is that it discourages people from asking big questions about important issues for which we do not have answers. And many of us are now pointing out that the amount of writing by management and organisational scholars on the really big problems facing the world is very tiny. I mean, I would say that even today, management journals have not had a great deal to say about the developing fourth industrial revolution, the growth of new technologies which are already revolutionising the world of work. And the answer is that that's a really big, big, important issue. We don't yet have many definitive answers can be hard to gather data. You might begin a form of inquiry that will take you a very long time. But the pressure is on young academics in particular to publish a lot of material quickly. So it's better to choose safe, uncontroversial topics with tried and tested methods rather than look at questions that really, really matter. And I think that needs to change. It's totally, in my opinion, dysfunctional at present. Yeah, I mean, Dennis kind of touched on a few points that we've discussed kind of recently, that idea of kind of publications growing kind of exponentially over the last 10, 20 years, and also that kind of importance of negative knowledge. They're all things that, that you'd certainly agree with, right, Janice? Uh, absolutely. I mean, one of my last lecture uh, in, uh, I'm conducting a series of supply chain lectures, and actually one of the last lecture was literally negative knowledge for supply chains, because we have, in the field of supply chain, we have this effect that we have um, essentially 90% plus case studies that are just demonstrating positive return on investment. And when I say 90%, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lower bound. It's probably like 99% plus, uh, you know, case studies that happen to be positive. But when you're in the actual industry, you see pretty much the, the opposite ratio, where most of the initiatives are not delivering ROI. Which is not surprising because usually companies test stuff all the time and most of the things that they test end up, you know, not working. If you had a recipe to every single move that you make in a company would actually t make the company more profitable, you would have like a complete, you know, uh, money making machine that would go, you know, completely uh, uh, um, on, on a completely ballistic trajectory. That is impossible. I mean, even, you know, the best companies around keeps making mistakes. Amazon made, the, you know, the Kindle Fire, which was, you know, a completely failed uh, a smartphone. So even the very best companies keeps making tons of mistakes. Uh, so, but the bottom line is that, uh, yes, I, I completely agree with negative knowledge. I think it's, um, it's something that really deserves a lot more attention, even if it's kind of, um, it may appear as, as boring. And uh, also one also uh, another area where it's my I would say my my pet interest would be I would be very interested if if um, if papers in academia the the reviews were systematically being published with the names of the reviewers. So basically, if you are a reviewer who end up being in the way of the publication of a paper that turned out to be very very good. You, your name will be remembered as being on the wrong side of history. What do you think, Dennis? Would something like that work? <laughs> well, there are these debates taking place, and there are many people who advocate exactly that. Um, I think the problem is maybe a little bit less with um, publishing the names of reviewers, but a little bit more about how academic journal editors use these reviews as a crutch. Yeah. And they therefore put the... Uh, peer, what, what peer review is, is when you submit a paper to an academic journal, and it goes out to two or three other so-called experts who then give you feedback along the lines of reject, 
revise and resubmit or accept. And a bit, uh, sometimes editors send papers through that process far too many times uh, so that the paper becomes utterly deformed, more and more complex as it goes through this process and all life and individuality can be beaten out of it. So one of the things that I now advocate and other people advocate is that after two rounds of review, a decision should be made by editors in principle as to whether this will be published or whether it will not be published. And that would stop this process of endless bloat, um, whereby the papers just keep on going and going and going. And people end up spending as much time writing letters to editors, justifying what they're now doing in relation to the reviewers' comments as they do in actually writing the papers. Uh, it's, it's, it's a horrendous waste of time, actually. Yeah. Um, let's start sort of wrapping things up by kind of looking at things from a perspective of a modern day manager within a business. I mean, Johannes kind of managers have to manage so many different things now, like staff welfare, diversity, and of course they need to manage kind of the growth of a company. I mean, what, what is, where should effective leaders kind of be spending their time? What should they be really focusing on? Uh, very tough. I mean, first I would say my, my own gut feeling is, uh, is find people that you trust and get feedback, you know, that's just as simple as that. That's very common sense, but uh, uh, it's just very, very difficult. So, uh, and, uh, and in terms of skills to develop, I, I think the, the most basic ones. So you see, again, I think, for example, one of the uh, underappreciated, you know, practice at Amazon that has, you know, I believe been uh, fueling their success are things that are exceedingly simple. For, the, for example, the fact that they work on memos that are in written form rather than PowerPoints. And, and people tend to underplay you know, the importance of simple things like that. The interesting things with a memo that you write is that you can't cheat with your idea. You need to have something that makes sense. You can't just have bullet points that give the impression of consistent uh, you know, and coherent thoughts when actually it's just a collection of things that are haphazardly you know, brought together. Um, so so that, you know, my, my suggestion would be to to focus on very basic elements, such as uh, you know the sort of elements of style by trunk, you know the sort of all, all, all techniques to, um, to to have more effective communication. Nothing new, so it's it's like century old science. Uh, but again, I don't pretend to have you know um, any specific expertise on recent results in management studies. So that's there is that as well. Dennis, what do you think? I mean, there's kind of, we spoke about it a bit earlier, this idea of managers having to create this kind of happy place, this happy environment. Um, would you say it's a very challenging time to be a manager with so many things to juggle? Well, yes, but it, it, it always has been a challenging time to be a manager, isn't it? And uh, what worries me about a lot of the stuff that comes out these days is that the expectation seems to be that the average man manager should be a superman or a superwoman excelling on all fronts all the time and all issues, inspiring people, keeping them happy, coming up with strategic insights, doing all kinds of wonderful things. Now, maybe one or two people in the world can do that, but most of us are closer to the average uh, than, than that. So I think one of the advantages of Johannes's idea about dissent is really it's another way of getting people to think like managers and become involved in the decision-making process themselves. And the more an organization relies on the wisdom of a genius at the top, the more trouble it is, it is in. I mean, I think we can do things to institutionalize these simple and basic things into the very top. For example, at top management meetings, we can more routinely spend time asking people, well, what's good about this decision, but how could it be better? Or what's wrong with this decision? What do we need to reconsider? In a way, compelling all of us, including the CEO, to become more critical of the processes that are going on their way. And in that way, we build a safe environment, um, a fearless organization in which it's okay to have different opinions. Because when we look at organizational failure, I think um, most of the time it can be traced back to that failure to encourage that form of participation. I listened to a talk recently by a top general in the British Army who was investigating the deaths of recruits during training exercises. And I recall he said that so far, everything he, every incident he had looked at, he had discovered that there always had been a point during the exercise in which it was obvious that something was going to go wrong, but nobody had spoken up. And the task that he saw in front of him was to try and create an environment 
in which when people saw something clearly fundamentally going wrong, they would speak without fear of retribution. Well, I think there are analogies there with the world of business organisations as well. And too often the people who point to something going wrong are regarded as contrarians who should be punished rather than people who should be treasured, rewarded and uh, promoted. There's a mind shift that has to take place in organisations to accomplish that. Yeah. And Johannes, do you kind of see this as something that could change, will be changing in the, in the future? Or do you feel that companies are going to con continue kind of in this kind of happy environment kind of direction? <laughs> I mean, I hope it will change, but I'm, you see, what I see on social media doesn't look very good, you know. Uh, even more when I see large American companies that directly go completely walk on pushing one way to see the world. And the problem is that precisely, you know, uh, w when you say that, um, especially, for example, I've seen, you know, large North American companies taking super strong position on one candidate, you know, presidential candidate versus another, from my own humble perspective, I would be horrified. I mean, you see, uh, who am I as a CEO to judge the political opinion of, of, of employees that are, you know, and again, that's, that's what dissent mean. It means that, you know, whatever is your, for example, your political opinion, you can, you have to be very tolerant. Uh, again, tolerance is not that you, that you, that you agree. It's just that, just that, that you tolerate things that are, that are, you know, that runs contrary to what you believe. It doesn't mean that you approve, doesn't mean that you, you know, and, and, um, and when I see that in the media, when basically some employees of some companies, you know, make something horrible, I would say horrible, you know, an, an act that is, that goes, I would say, against mainstream values. Um, the, the problem that I see is that suddenly it's, uh, it's a company that is declared guilty as if, you know, the company had to be monolithically aligned with the opinion of its employees. You see, that's, for me, that's, uh, that's very, very troubling at so many levels because if, if suddenly the media can blame me for the opinions of my employees, then I, 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 mean to, I need to be, you know, to do some witch hunting to get rid of the people who have, you know, opinion that I believe to be dangerous. And that's, you see, that's, that's a very, very slippery slope. Okay, Dennis, we'll leave the, the final word to you. Um, what's next for management studies? Can you see it kind of regaining its reputation? What do you see as coming next? Yeah, well, it, it has a little bit uh, to go because management studies as a discipline that involves an awful lot of fad surfing. We identify this, that or the other fad or a new buzzword and then we go herring after it at warp factor 10 to usually no productive effect. But if I can have the last word, I would like to say something again about this issue of the importance of dissent. You see, I think that there is only one organizational context that I can think of where everybody agrees with everybody else all the time on all important issues, and that's a graveyard. In the real world that the rest of us live in, people do have dissenting opinions all the time anyway. If the CEO or the top people aren't hearing them, that just means that they're being expressed behind their backs. It's far better to get these opinions out into the open and then try and take positive advantage uh, of them. And if there is any way forward for management studies, and I hope and I do believe that there is, it is definitely that more and more people are becoming dissatisfied with the status quo. Academics themselves are more and more dissatisfied with this and the publication of my book is part of that trend to expressing sceptical uh, opinions. More critical pieces are appearing in our academic journals. And there are more academic journals appearing that are attempting to address these kinds of questions in a more productive and systematic manner than is the, uh, than is the norm. I'm delighted to be a little bit a part of that, and I hope that more people will join us in the future. Okay, brilliant. We'll have to wrap it up there, but uh, thank you both for your time. So that's everything for this week. Thanks very much for tuning in, and we'll see you again in the next episode. Thanks for watching.